Hello! You're watching the Great Canadian Bagel, and today we have another Canadian election update for you. <clears throat> now, as you see here, I have fully updated to a new map. I'm no longer using the one from Polling Canada. And going forward, uh, just comment below if you have any quibbles about this, if something that's not very visible, or if you want me to expand some of the cutouts or something like that, I can go in, I can make adjustments to it as needed. But for now, this is what we are looking at. And I hope it is visible enough for everybody here. I've also changed the color balance a little bit, because in the past people have complained that their colors were too dark. Like, it was too hard to distinguish between, like, the Conservatives in particular were hard to distinguish between them. I've tried to space them out a bit more and reduce the overall darkness. Let me know if it works. I can always suggest that. It's not, there. it's not very difficult. But before I begin with the rest of the video, I would just like to say once more, if you want to support my channel, by all means, go down below and... Uh, oh like share subscribe all those things but become a channel member as well it greatly helps the channel and it gives me a lot of resources i can use to make this better for future videos well with no further ado let us begin so we are now entering february february 24. so at this stage i had expected and i talked about this a little bit last video in January, that the Conservatives would be hitting a trough. Turns out I was wrong. Don't want to rehash all of that because I touched on it last video, but I will just emphasize this yet again because of how wrong I was. We now have the new peak for the Conservatives in seat total. This is the most seats I have ever recorded them under my ideal use of my model. Every other, I have, if you follow me on Twitter, occasionally have published projections with more aggressive conservative seat totals, like maps for them, they might be floating around. But those were using a more aggressive recency bias. Here I am using a much lower recency bias, one that I think is more accurate to between elections because people are not as tuned in, they're not as paying attention, so vote intentions are slower than otherwise. One pull, one update, one wave is not necessarily indicative of where everybody is because not everyone is engaged yet. However, over time, more and more polls, more and more updates, and we start approaching where the polls are. Because if every poll is saying low 40s, we are going to get to low 40s eventually, even with the lower recency bias. That's just what all the data says. So now, we have really approached this. We're at 200 seats for the Conservatives, 40.8% of the vote. And there are several seats still that they can gain. We're not capped out, if you will. Just here, we have one in Hamilton. We have one in St. John. We have Charlottetown. We have, heck, uh, Bedford-Sackville. Beaujour, Madawaska, Restigouche, Fleetwood, Fleetwood Port Kells, I think that's what it is, Vancouver Quandra, Vancouver Center, Elmwood Transcona, Timmins area, I can't think of the whole name of this writing, it's brand new, forgive me, London Fashua, Neopene. There's already a bunch. Then we have all sorts and the GTA, there's a bunch in Brampton, a bunch in Mississauga, there's some in Don Valley. There's a bunch more ridings that are competitive 
for the Conservatives. They could still go up from here. It's not guaranteed. They could also go down. But they are firmly still on an upswing. Let's plot the, the raw data here because I'll be a bit clear. And I just realized here, I have the Greens at 3 and 1.7 and the PPC at 1.7, but I have them at 3.2 and 1.9 here. So this is, the map is wrong here. This data sheet is more accurate than the map. Apologies. But it's pretty minor. The seat totals are correct. So as we can see, our January 15th update, since then we've had 0.72 swing in popular vote for the Conservatives, a similar 0.75 away from the Liberals. The Liberals have lost 13 seats, the Conservatives have gained 12, and the Bloc has gained 1. Net, I should say. This is quite dramatic. And if you go way back to last June, June 25th here, back when the Conservatives really started their upward swing, when it really started to become apparent, way back when, we were at a tie, two-seat lead for the Conservatives, a just shy of a five-point lead in popular vote. We are now just shy of seven months from this. Let's say six and a half. And in six and a half months, the Conservatives have gained four and a half percentage points in popular vote. The Liberals have lost just about that much as well. The Liberals have lost 51 seats. And the Conservatives have gained 59. Now, part of the conservative gains in seats is that they've added new seats. You will notice here, we're using a 343 seat map. These totals will add up to 343. But even with that, it's quite shocking. And the liberals aren't really in a good position anywhere. If we just look at just these two updates, January 15th to February 2nd, Newfoundland, down. PEI, down. Nova Scotia, down. New Brunswick, down. Quebec, down. Ontario, down. Manitoba, down. Saskatchewan, down. Alberta, down. BC, down. Territories, down. <laughs> They're down in literally every single province. The Conservatives, meanwhile, are up in every single province albeit Quebec's only 0.1% upwards. That's very shocking. It's not what I thought was going to happen. I thought things would cool down. Though, as some people have alluded to, some people who've done this longer than me, so they have perhaps more wisdom, and that's fair. One being Nick Covelis, I believe he's the CEO of Campaign Research, was saying, <laughs> I should have thought about this, but inflation's been high. So spending over the course of the fall would have been high, way higher than normal. And people pay for Christmas and all that come January, February. That is going to cause a big awakening moment for people who have not been very plugged in. Wow, bills are really, really high. Things are really expensive. And they're going to look. And the rest is history. Okay. But it's more than just that. Because we still have mortgages. We still have housing. And it's not good condition for either. And in fact, because I've been in contact with lots of real estate agents recently, and I've been talking to them and looking at houses, naturally. Most are already seeing the housing market pick up again. People, real estate agents are seeing houses in greater Halifax area and a lot of the surrounding counties that are quite rural. Dozens of or not dozens of bids, sorry, but multiple bids, competitive bids. It's raising prices up again. 
It's pushing things above listing price. And the listing price is already almost certainly worth or higher than the actual property is worth. Even in very rural areas, very small towns, you're probably looking at houses that are 100% overvalued. And by that I mean the dollar value paid for the house is twice of what the fundamental value is of the house. The sad reality of that is you can't just opt to not buy said house because then you have no house. There is no foreseeable future where the housing market is going to go down. If raising core interest rates from a quarter percent to five has had very little diff impact over the grand scheme of things on housing, yes, there was a slight dip from the peak, but mostly in the biggest, most expensive jurisdictions, the Torontos, Vancouver is really more so than smaller cities like Halifax or even like a London. There is really little hope that that is going to change very much. But the run-on effects of many things, both be it taxes, be it inflation, be it the interest rates, construction is going down. And yes, price growth is suppressed, so in the grand scheme of things, it was likely a good decision to raise interest rates. It's not a panacea. It's not going to solve the housing crisis, the housing prices. And since we have no relief on the horizon and the problem is getting worse, that is going to cause increasingly more and more angst. And it might even accelerate more. We could very well be in a position very well that the conservatives could be going up to their ceiling and i've estimated a while back that barring a breakthrough in quebec their ceiling is roughly 47 percent that would entail gaining ground in quebec but when i say a breakthrough i mean breaking through their quebec ceiling which is like 30 35 percent range Assuming they don't break through the Quebec ceiling, they're gonna, they're seen to be approaching a 47%. They might even go further than that. And that's because, again, inflation is still not particularly under control. We're still looking at 3%. That's still above target. The goal is about 2. So that's still higher than normal inflation. The economy isn't doing very well. Productivity growth is negative. In other words, per capita GDP is decreasing. In other words, people aren't going to like or likely should not expect greater than inflation raises. They might be even getting less than inflation raises because the productivity is not there. If there's no new productivity, there is no new money to give people. Companies aren't just going to pay you at a loss. Your new productivity has to be a net gain for them. For what they're paying you and there's even more worry there because central bank statements from the bank of canada and other similar banks bank of england bank the uh, federal reserve in the u.s seem to imply that all of the big banks central banks expect inflation to rebound which again should make sense we're seeing three percent right now ish in the winter in Q1, when it should be the lowest, once we start seeing Q3, when it goes to the highest, it's going to probably exceed 3%. We might get 3.5%, maybe even 4 It could be more. It depends on a lot of things. For example, oil prices will heavily impact that. If the price of oil spikes again, like it has the last couple of years, like it always go, it's always going to spike in the summer, but if it spikes more than normal, as it has, again, the last couple of years, we could see inflation get quite high again because the price of gas and diesel heavily impacts the price of everything because that's how we move things. If it costs 10% more to transit your goods, you're going to see that 
cost carried forward to the end consumer. Someone has to pay for that. It's not going to be the companies. So we're in a very difficult situation for the liberals. In a very bad situation. It's going to keep getting worse and worse because the economy isn't doing well. They will often point, and I think this is a big failing of the liberal campaign, the liberal party, the liberal government. They'll point to all these indexes saying Canada's number one or whatever, or number two or number three, things like quality of life or healthcare or whatever. But you can point to some index that has some criteria. Usually they're terrible, but sometimes they're valid, sure. And that doesn't really matter because people don't care about that. It's sort of a truism in politics, but people really only care about things that impact them. What a NGO says about the state of Canada doesn't affect someone. The average voter doesn't really care how Canada's doing relative to the rest of the world. Maybe it's true. Maybe the rest of the world is doing awful and Canada's doing better than them. But no one actually cares about that. You tell someone, yeah, your standard of living is going down. Yeah, you can't afford to buy a house. Yeah, your job's not keeping up with inflation. Or your raises or whatever. Your salaries. Yeah, your healthcare sucks. Yeah, your education is for your kids is going to be worse. But hey, it's worse in France. Assuming that is true, who cares? I don't care that it's worse in, say, France. I want it to be good here. We don't measure things based on the failures of others. We measure things based off what's here, what's local, what's visceral. And we're seeing time and again the liberals deploy this same campaign strategy. And it really just reeks of desperation. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. They're stuck. But it's worse than just they're stuck. If it was just that they were stuck, it wouldn't be so bad. They're floundering. You see this again with their other main talking point that they're using these days. Which is that Poilievre is a radical like Trump. Which is a terrible line to go at. For very many reasons. First off, it's just not true, and anyone who's paying attention knows that is just not true. Polyev and Trump have a very different rhetorical style. They're talking about actually different solutions. They might both be vaguely right-wing solutions in a lot of situations, but they're not the same solution. That's like saying Justin Trudeau is Joseph Stalin. They're both left-wing. It's absurd. It's stupid. It's a waste of oxygen. But it's worse than just those. Because, I think, perhaps naively, the assumption is Canadians don't like Trump, so if they compare Polyev to Trump, they can convince Canadians that you shouldn't support him because he's like Trump. The problem with that assumption, though, is they are banking that Canadians dislike Trump more than they care about the quality of life right now. Now, that doesn't seem particularly of a bold assumption, but it really is. There is a certain, I can't think of the proper word for this, but there is a, there's a trend in politics and psychology that if something sucks and someone's complaining about it sucking and they want to fix it, for example, 
you have quality of saying, I want to fix the status quo because the status quo sucks. And then you say that someone like quality of saying the status quo sucks and he wants to fix it is like a radical, someone that the average person doesn't like, then only then usually what happens is you actually legitimize that radical's position because people see that the world sucks. So if you're not talking about why healthcare sucks, why education sucks, why the economy sucks, why housing sucks, you're not providing real concrete solutions or at least being perceived as such, but instead you are saying that the person who is talking about those issues is a crazy radical, what you actually are telling people is that, no, that guy isn't this crazy radical that you thought was a crazy radical all this time. He's not actually that crazy. He's not actually that much of a radical. So in the grand scheme of things, the liberal campaign strategy to link Poiliev to Trump is actually just legitimizing Trump to Canadians. In the probably the most effective and efficient way possible. Because if you look at polling pre Poiliev, 2021, 2022, only like 20% of Canadians liked or would have voted for Trump in a hypothetical situation where they were in the US. And they're voting for Trump or Biden. Now, more recent polls say this is closer to 34%. That's not a coincidence. We're not seeing something like that change because it's changing. Just randomly. It's changing because liberal political rhetoric is legitimizing Donald Trump to Canadians. Is that good or bad? Well, it's up to your perspective. I'm not going to dictate to you what you have to perceive as good or bad. But that's what's happening. That's what they're doing. So in the short, short, short term, it might help them wedge some, some voters and it might help them win some key ridings. Maybe on this map, some of these light blue ridings I have, like, I don't know, uh, Burnaby North here, maybe that means they might win Burnaby North because they wedged just the right number of voters. And it's hard to pull up on the aggregate, but they just they just nearly did it. Perhaps, maybe they did that. But it's a destructive policy. It's worse than a scorched earth policy. Because politically, what you are doing is destroying your party's credibility in the future. You are burning the bridge you are standing on by doing rhetoric crap like this. It doesn't really work even in the medium term. It only sort of barely works in the short term. And it's utterly destructive in the long term to your politics, to your beliefs. Because you are linking, fixing the problem that regular people can see with their own eyes with some politics that you detest. And that's the entire liberal campaign right now. Sure, we're not in an election, so we're not going to see details of policy. We're not going to see great things. That makes sense. That's fine. But when you're flattering in the polls this much, you would expect them to start doing something. But instead, all they lean on is Poiliev is Trump, or look at all these things. We're actually not doing poorly. Or then you might see them attack provincial conservatives like Danielle Smith and be like, look, she hates trans kids because of her parental rights bill. Look how evil she is. But again, that's a terrible strategy. And it's a self-defeating strategy. Maybe again, it might wedge a few voters in a few niche writings, but it is burning the bridge they're standing on because bills like Daniel Smith proposed or is going to implement, when previously poll tested, had somewhere in the realm of 80% support. 
So if 80% of Canadians think that this is a good idea, and you're saying, no, it's a terrible idea, and you're evil, horrible humans for saying you want it, that you're the scum of the earth, you're the worst people, you want to kill people, whatever, but 80% of the population supports it, and there's politicians doing it, what you're telling those people is that that politician, she's your person. She's your girl. I'm not your girl. She is. So in other words, these reactions, these decisions, hurt the Liberal Party, hurt the Alberta NDP, help the Alberta NDP and Daniel Smith in particular, and in the grand scheme of things, will probably help the Conservative Party as a whole, even if Poiliev does literally nothing. Because, again, strategically speaking, even doing nothing, what he does is by just saying nothing, he allows the Liberals to draw the contrast between him and them on a social issue, which... If it's a slam dunk social issue like this, that might not be the most effective strategy, but it's generally speaking a very effective strategy to let the opponent paint you on social issue by implic implication. Because all social issues are inherently divisive. We're not talking about changing the tax rate 1 or 2% or how much wealth fair to give someone like is it a thousand dollars is it two thousand dollars we're not talking about how many doctors we need those aren't really divisive questions it's more of money practicality whatever it's more of mundane questions if you're asking who is more should parents have the right to understand to veto to accept consent to major life-altering irreversible medical decisions or should they not that's inherently divisive the people who support parents are going to be what's word for incensed by the opposition to it and the people who oppose the parents position on this are going to be incensed as well it's inherently divisive and that's always true with every social issue it's one of the reasons why historically social conservatism hasn't done very well because a lot of social conservatives f forget this they forget how divisive social policy is it's usually more effective to not talk about it though at the same time you do need to talk about it so it's a, it's a very difficult conundrum it's a tough balancing act So what we're really seeing as a whole is Trudeau is legitimizing Trump. He's alienating voters by saying, by, by his party and his surrogate saying everything's fine when it isn't. He's alienating voters, 80% of the population, all the parents, for opposing basic parental rights laws. And all Poiliev is doing is talking about fixing problems. He's not saying anything divisive. He has no divisive plans on the books. He's talking about, oh, we're going to build houses. We're going to tie immigration to housing, so we're not going to take more than we can house. Great. We're going to change red tape rules so you can build things we're going to make it so you can get your mine approval or disapproval in 18 months and not 25 years stuff like that we're going to cut taxes we're going to run programs better basic basic stuff things that as i just previously touched on are not particularly divisive how many people are going to be outraged or really care that much about changing the red tape around an iron mine approval. Some environmental types might be, but most people aren't environmental types, and most people don't care. But the people who do care, care a lot. 
And that's kind of the situation one. We're really seeing Trudeau look rudderless. And Polyev isn't. Now, you might then ask, quite rightly, why? Why, why would this, why, why is this happening? Why is Trudeau so rudderless? It doesn't make any sense. And that, it really does seem to be the case, probably sparked by some of the polls recently, but it's been going on for probably the last at least three years, if not earlier, longer, possibly since 2019 even, Trudeau's lost a lot of really key, important figures in his party. People like uh, Jerry Butts, even Bill Morneau. And he's basically been left with B or C tier replacements. Because the party's doing so poorly, he can't attract A tier talent to replace them. Perhaps, even, the Liberals don't have any A-tier talent waiting in the wings to replace them, but that's a longer story. We won't really know about that until they lose and then try to rebuild. Now, why would Jerry Butts and, who was his former campaign manager, and Bill Morneau be particularly problematic to lose? More than other cabinet ministers, more than other key advisors. Well, the core of a government is basically three people in a, a democracy. You have your face, strategist, and money guy. Now, each of these three people has a very distinct role. One person could do all three, but usually you can't find someone who has the qualities and skills to do all three. So what does the face need to do? Well, he needs to be able to talk well. He needs to be able to argue well. He needs to look good to the on camera. He has to have a sort of empathy that can connect to regular people and not be completely exhausted and burned out by it. Which is a lot harder said than done. Anyone who's ever worked a lot of retail could probably tell you that. It's not, it's not hard per se, but it's a tiring thing to have that kind of empathy. And they have to be able to make good decisions. They have to be able to hire the right people. That's the, that's the face's job. Has to be able to talk well, connect to people, and make good hiring decisions. And be decisive, if you want to put a fourth. Okay, what does the strategist need to do? Well, he needs to be smart. That's very important. The face doesn't need to be too too smart per se, but it's useful. But he needs to, the 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 strategist needs to be really good at electoral politics. He has to really understand the psychology of voters per se, what the party's good at, what their platform is, what their messaging is and how to best marshal that, but they also need to understand who all the opponents are. Opposition research and all of that. They need to be quite well versed in not just their own, but their rivals and their future rivals. And what policy decisions might turn things the right way. Okay, the liberals are thinking right now. What should they do to fix that? If you can answer that question, that's, and it's not an easy question to answer. Don't fool yourself. If you can answer that question, like, affirmatively, like, the liberals should do this, that will help them by Y amount. If you can answer that question and you're right about it, then you're starting to get the inkling of what it takes to be a strategist. But it's not just one decision, it's decision after decision after decision. And Jerry Butts was that strategist for 2015 and up to 2019 when he then left during SNC. Though they still probably seem to care, they still seem to have carried on with his strategy 
without him helming it now. And then finally you need the money guy. Now the money guy doesn't need to be good at talking, doesn't need to be really good at explaining himself, doesn't need to be very charismatic. The money guy needs to be good at money. The money guy needs to understand how economies work, how something like a mixed economy like Canada is actually functions, what the high level impact of tax changes or regulation changes or foreign international trade changes like all that stuff what is that actually going to do not just to revenues but also the economy as a whole how do you increase the average person's quality of life that kind of stuff the money guy needs to be really good at that because that is the most relevant issue for a government to get re-elected if the economy sucks you're not likely going to get re-elected. It's very, very difficult. And Bill Morneau, for the most part, was that guy for the Liberals. And he's gone now. So now they're operating at like a C or D level campaign strategist because you can just tell their campaign is terrible. They have no idea what they're doing. And they have maybe a B tier, maybe even a C tier economy person which is freeland now and unlike morneau there's very little reason to believe freeland knows what she's doing morneau at least had credentials in the right area and work experience in a right area to at least conceivably be good at doing economy was he very good i'll let actual economists assess that or not but he had I hate saying this, but he had the credentials to at least appear like he'd be good decision. Good choice. Freeland doesn't. And for now, Freeland is not succeeding. Is that entirely her fault? Is that extrin extrin extrinsic to Canada's situation? Again, I'm not going to weigh on that. I'm not an economist. I don't have the best saying of that. But what I can say is that on the ground, regular voters aren't feeling it. They don't feel like the government is doing a good job. And that's the most important thing to all three of these positions. And that's the final thing I will leave off here. It doesn't matter if you were doing good objectively. It does not matter if you are doing all the right things what matters is voters trust you that's why in the last video on alberta i was talking so much about vibes and how vibes matter the vibe of a government is crucial because the average person joe blow who did not take economics in university not even first year economics in university doesn't really understand the economy very much. They might have learned some through osmosis, or they might be a hobbyist, might be passively interested in econ economics. They might have taken it even, again, for some, some courses. But if you're not that, then you probably have very little idea. And if you're at least a hobbyist or someone passively interested or taking a couple of courses, you might have a vague idea of what's going on. But you're talking about only a vague idea then it doesn't really mean much to you that oh, we're doing this okay what is that we're gonna raise we're gonna add a new tax bracket on i think two hundred fifteen thousand household or individual income at 37 percent. okay what does that actually do does it raise revenue turns out no at least in the grand scheme of things huh and that's the thing like, I'm not saying it's bad that people aren't like this. That's one thing you really want to stress for anyone new to my channel or watching this who in the future. When I say average people are like this, that is not an elitist thought. I'm not saying it's beneath them or above them. I'm just saying they don't care. They don't know. 
It's a matter of fact. It's just a statement. And that's a really important thing to distinguish. Because a lot of people, when you're talking about politics, when you're talking about government, let themselves get confused on that and think treating or acting like the average voter doesn't have a good understanding of some things is bad when in fact that's kind of the purpose of representative democracy unless you support a direct democracy you are in intrinsically saying that not everybody is informed about everything because they shouldn't be voting on it. That's why we have MLAs, MPs. Because we recognize as a society that not everyone is informed about every issue. But with that, I will bid you all adieu. And I will see you hopefully again next week with something different. Again, just a reminder... I'm not entirely sure how consistent I'm going to be hitting these upload schedules. I have a lot of things on the plate. So we're probably going to be postponing some of the more detailed stuff, like understanding politics for the time being. But these kind of videos that I'm doing right now, where I'm just talking about the state of Canadian politics or provincial politics, these will probably still keep coming relatively on timetable because... The workload difference is lower on this. Like, to make a projection like this one, just to pull the curtain back a bit, there's a lot of initial work that goes into making a map, making model, doing math, collecting polls, etc. But at the end of the day, if I have a week to make a video, I might have two, three, four polls to put in that week. That's not that much work. And then I have a video record, and then I'm good. If I want to make an understanding politics video, I need to write an entire script. I need to find good visuals. I need to do all this other stuff. I have no problem doing that. I like doing it, actually. Those videos perform mediocre. But I do them anyways because I actually enjoy those videos. But they take way more time to do. So we're, we're, we're going to pull those back for now until my personal life is less interesting. <laughs> so. With that. I close, and I'll bid you all adieu.